Okay. All right. Good evening. Uh, turn your Bible, if you would, to First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three, and God helping me, and Lord willing, we are going to continue um, looking at the requirements for an ideal pastor or bishop, uh, being the wording of verse one. We'll read verses one through. Uh, three tonight, and we will look at, Lord willing, not given to wine. Uh, starting in verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, which we covered before, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, which we looked at last week, not given to wine, which Lord Willen will look at tonight, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Dear God, please help me. Give me the word to say. Uh, I need your help. I can't do it without you. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. So you'll notice the first uh, expression at the beginning of verse 3, not given to wine. And this, by definition, is a controversy uh, because drinking wine is listed in Romans chapter 14. Keep your finger here and turn there. Romans chapter 14 as an example of something um, that people might have liberty about. Uh, Romans chapter 14 and look in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. In other words, don't destroy what God is doing with someone uh, just so that you can satisfy yourself with meat if they're going to be offended by you eating meat in front of them. And in the context of this chapter, uh, meat sacrificed to idols, but meat in general. Look at verse 20. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure. Remember that. But it is evil for that man who eateth with, with offense. So the teaching of Romans 14 is that your behavior in front of other Christians, uh, the, the morality of it, the rightness or wrongness of what you should or shouldn't eat uh, in this example, um, what you should or shouldn't do if you, you know, go to a baseball game, go to baseball games or not, if you go to movies or not, and these uh, different examples, and there are uh, several examples listed in this chapter of things that kind of fall in that category that are known to be controversial, that people disagree about, that one Christian might say, I don't have any problem with that, so I'm going to do it. Whereas another Christian is to be like, no, no, that's bad. I was taught from my youth up that that's bad. I don't want any part of that. And if you drink it in front of me, I'm going to be offended. See, it is what Romans 14 is talking about. And just to summarize, the teaching is summarized at the beginning of verse 1, chapter 15. We then that are strong at, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, let the reproaches of them that reproach thee fall on me. So. Jesus Christ said, I'm not here to exercise my own liberty and make myself happy. I'm here to minister to others, not to be ministered to. I am your servant. And as Christians, we are his servant, but we're also meant to be servants to each other. And so what that means is that I have to be aware of where you are and what your beliefs are and what your gross are where you are in your growth, and to be careful not to overstep with something that I might have liberty about in your presence, lest you be offended 
and be hindered in your growth because of that. You say, well, you have liberty, you should be able to have liberty. Yeah, but you're thinking about yourself. See, you're not thinking about your brother. The Bible says here earlier in the chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 15, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. See, you stop thinking about your brother. You're not exercising charity towards him that you're supposed to exercise so that you can be pleased with 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 a uh, with steak and i love steak don't get me wrong <laughs> you know i'm about to have one probably tomorrow night <laughs> i had one sunday i'll probably have another one besides that before the week is over but the teaching of the new testament is you have to think about other people before you think about yourself and you have to put them above you not only esteem them uh, uh better than you you have to put their needs before your own. Amen? In this thing about rightness or wrongness. Uh, so, uh, liberty. Uh, and something that somebody might have liberty from God to be able to do. So look at verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Right, so my ta my father taught me many things growing up of what I should and shouldn't do. Like I should never join the navy was one thing. You know? <laughs> should never, don't ever let me catch you going near that. You know, <laughs> and that whole argument from the navy. Well, the marines are part of the navy, you know, and but if I had done that as an adult, when it was time to do that, then I'd be not walking charitably towards my father. I'd be spitting in his face and deliberately showing him a lack of respect even though there is absolutely nothing wrong with being in the Navy in, in and of itself. Nothing is unclean of itself, he said. Now that's kind of a loose example. But the examples here, one of which is drinking wine, look at verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Meaning you have enough faith to drink wine before God without sin. And you're, you can glorify God in it without the abuse. Whereby thy brother stone, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God, not in front of other people. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, or whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So the rightness or wrongness of, in this case, drinking wine, because we're talking about not giving to wine, which we'll cover, or, or uh, we, will, we won't cover it, but we'll preach on it in a, in, a, in a few minutes, is relative in the instance of Romans 14. Dr. Ruckman gives the example of um, when he was older, he traveled around the world on missions trips, to different mission places where missionaries were and they had meetings and he was in this church in Korea where as part of the communion they have alcoholic wine instead of we have grape juice which has no alcohol right and so Mrs. Ruckman Pam was like you know what do I do we can't do this there's alcohol in it. and Dr. Ruckman's like down the hatch you don't want to offend these people because they have liberty see because nothing is unclean of itself. You follow that? All right, now turn back to 1 Timothy 3. And the Bible says that for a bishop, he is not to be given to wine. Now, first of all, the wine that we just looked at in Romans 14 is clearly an example of alcoholic wine, not the grape juice that Jesus made in John 2. Because it's a controversy that one person might have liberty about, whereas somebody else might not have liberty. Because who do you know that has doesn't have liberty to drink non-alcoholic grape juice? Right? So there are examples and circumstances in the scripture um, of an, uh, that show a circumstance in which 
alcohol is prescribed. So, for example, uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, and look in verse uh, 23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake in thine oft infirmities. And so in this instance, he says a little wine, and a person who has a problem drinking is going to take this verse and say, see, see, I can drink wine. And it says a little wine, therefore I drink wild turkey. It says a little wine, therefore I can have whatever I want. And that is not what it says. It says a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thine oft infirmities. So the Bible is prescribing the use of alcohol medicinally. So this would, so an example of this would be whatever percentage of alcohol is in NyQuil when you have a bad cold right? A little wine um, is the instance here, is the example here. But the fact that it's listed in Romans 14 means that as an example of somebody might not have liberty to drink any alcohol, okay, good, then you shouldn't have NyQuil near them. Or you shouldn't have NyQuil at all for the purpose of being an example to them, to other people who might have an issue. But nothing is unclean of itself. Into the pure, all things are pure, the Bible says. All right, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And... Uh, this is important. These, these things are important. Um, to cover, and the reason why I keep saying the word cover, even though you never actually cover completely any scripture, the word of God is eternal. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, and I can never ever come close to covering everything that they say, even one verse. Ephesians chapter 5, and look down in verse uh, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit. So the instruction is to be not drunk with wine where it is excess. Be not drunk with wine because drunkenness is an example of excess. Obviously. <laughs> and so that's something that we are commanded not to do, period. Um, and the instruction in 1 Timothy 3 is not given to wine. And turn back there, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And look down in verse, look at the requirement for deacon in verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. So if it was not, if it was, you're not allowed to touch wine at all, then, it, then there would be no need to say not given to much wine. So instead he says not given, he says not given to much wine to make it clear uh, that he's talking about the excess and the abuse of it um, versus wine, period. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, do, I am not and do not uh, preach that you should go drink wine. In fact, the example that's given, the instruction that's given here is uh, to not be given over to it, which would be a description of a drunkard. Uh, we know that drunkards don't have any place in the, in the kingdom of God, that they don't inherit the kingdom, no reward for them in the kingdom. And so as, an ex as, a, as a bishop, you're supposed to be an example of what everybody else is supposed to be. And you'll hear... Uh, all over the world, uh, Bible-believing preachers and churches uh, uh, say that the Bible does not, the Bible teaches absolute abstinence from wine in all circumstances, period. And I'm not saying to abuse it, and I'm not saying that you should even drink it. But what I won't say is what the Bible doesn't say. And in the New Testament, it does not say. 
that you should completely abstain from wine. It does say, under the two uh, things that I just listed, number one, that as an example to other believers, you shouldn't be given over to it. You shouldn't be given to much wine. You should never be drunk with it. And you shouldn't be given to it. And also, you're not walking charitably towards your brethren uh, if you drink wine and offend them by it. Romans chapter 14. But in your approach to the Word of God, you, you have to follow exactly what it says. You can't make it say more than it says. Because the principles that are involved here are not, well, here's a bunch of rules that you have to keep. And, you know, my, grand, my grandfather, my, my well, here's, here's a true story. My uncle was a drunk. He abused my three cousins, not my uncle that we met, another uncle on the other side. He abused his three cousins. He, I was always having to get calls in the middle of the night when I was growing up. My dad would get a call. Hey, uh, uh, can you help me find Kim? She's lost somewhere. I mean, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, drunk somewhere on the side of the road, abused. And where do you think she picked that up? She picked that up from the example of her father not teaching her. And from being a bad example and, sh and, show and, and showing her the way uh, to abuse alcohol. And that is wicked and evil. And that does nothing but destroy families. And as a preacher, it's your job uh, to lead people the other way. But you cannot lead people the other way by lying about what the Bible says. You have to teach the words that the Holy Spirit gives us. And there's more to the things that are operating here than do this, don't do that. In this instance is you need to learn how to love one another, even as I have loved you. And one way in which you're supposed to love one another is be an example to them and to not offend them with things that you may or may not have liberty to do. And then there's the mystery of faith that, that's talked about uh, in chapter 3, verse 9, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience, part of which includes, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Because God might reveal something to Daniel that he didn't reveal to me yet, and I don't know what it is, so he doesn't rub it in my face and offend me by it. He in meekness instructs me, uh, as I oppose myself and points out, hey, dad, that doesn't seem, are you sure you're right about that? I think you should think, can I show you this verse? I look at it, I see that he's right, and I'm corrected, and vice versa. That, that's walking charitably. Not, uh, well, you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm not talking to you no more. You know, I just, and not even give me a chance. See? It's the principle is walking charitably towards your brother in these things. And specifically, as an example to others, if you're going to make a mistake on one side of it, you should, you should make a mistake on not having any part of it. But what you should not do is claim that the Bible teaches uh, don't ever have any part of it for any reason. Because what the Bible says is nothing is unclean of itself. And to the pure, all things are pure. All right, now, that's not the end. Turn to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter, or actually, sorry, before we get there, look at uh, Numbers chapter 28. Numbers chapter 28. As a preacher and a minister of the Word of God, you have to be honest with people about what the Bible says, regardless of the effect that you think it will have. Because God, in the writing of the Bible, has the, perf has the perfect balance. Uh, Numbers chapter 28. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And look down in verse... I'll get there in a minute. Numbers chapter 28. And look down in verse... Uh, look down in verse 7. And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of an hen for the one lamb. In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine 
to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. So there's an instance in which strong wine, which I believe we can take, because the same expression is applied, strong drink, uh, is in, in this instance something that God receives as an offering. So there's an instance in which its use is allowed. Turn to Deuteronomy uh, 14. One book over. And look down in verse 22. Deuteronomy 14. And look down in verse 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. So this is a once a year thing thing that he's talking about where you tithe all the increase from the fruit of your farm your uh, uh, your seed your farming and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there that's Jerusalem to tithe of thy corn of thy wine and of thine oil in the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God all thy ways. So that's giving 10% of all these things. Verse 24, And the, if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, that's, you know, you're a hundred miles away, you just can't make it there, you have to leave your farm for too long when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shall go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. So you can't bring all of this wine and seed and stuff all the way to Jerusalem, because it's too far. So sell it and bring the money. Right? You with me so far? And then verse 26, And thou shalt bestow that money, for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. So here's an example of God telling the Jews under the law once a year, when you bring your tithe, to go ahead and get strong drink and rejoice before the Lord in those things. Bible says. All right, now, that's not the end. Because, uh, turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is to give you a complete picture of everything that the Bible says about, about alcohol, about wine. And I started with the thing that you never hear preached. But the fact remains, the Bible says, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God in the book of Acts, Paul said. And it's the responsibility of the, pre the preacher, a minister of the word of God, to preach the word of God as God counsels him to preach. Um, Proverbs chapter 31, and look down in verse 4. Actually, start unto uh, start in verse three. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. See, so you're in a position of responsibility. You don't have any business being affected by alcohol because it's going to cause you to not be able to do your job, right? However, verse 6, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine to those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. So there's, an, there's a prescribed instance by the Holy Ghost where, uh, you know, you're on your deathbed, nothing but pain. Um, so you're going to uh, get a morphine drip, which is the same exact thing that we're talking about. It's a medicinal use of, uh, here it's specifically wine and strong drink. Morphine has the same effect. 
it's to numb you up so you can't feel the pain as much to make you comfortable as you as you're ready to perish. But that ain't you. That ain't you. All right, that's still not the end. Turn to uh, turn to uh, to Proverbs chapter twenty. Proverbs chapter twenty. And look in verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So wine, by definition, is a mocker. It mocks you. It, you come under its power uh, when you exceed the, the prescribed use. So take a little wine for the sake of your stomach. That's like, I imagine that to be like in, in Timothy's day, okay, one sip, like a spoonful of uh, cough medicine or something. And that'll help your stomach, it'll help you fall asleep, it'll help you get rest, and maybe you'll feel better tomorrow. It is not an instance of abuse because the moment you abuse it, that is called excess and you're commanded not to do it. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. All right. Now uh, turn two chapters over to chapter 23, part of chapter 23, and look down at verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine... They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. So here's a guy whose heavy heart is made heavier, or whose redness of eyes, whose sickness who returns like a dog to his own vomit and has all kind of trouble that is only increased because he tarries long at the wine. See? Have a sip and fall asleep. Don't keep going. <laughs> because it will only end uh, in uh, evil things. Verse 34, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of the mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. See? And that's an example, not just of a drunkard, and the behavior and the heart attitude, and what drives a guy like that, it's also an example of anybody who's addicted to something. So a drug addict, drug addict same thing. Uh, and it doesn't have to be drugs or alcohol. There's all kinds of things uh, that you can be addicted to, that you will return to, that, that you have a void that you're trying to fill, or an emotion that you're trying to tickle, or just something that you love to feel sorry for yourself about, that... Uh, that you need to just wallow in, that you've learned to enjoy the wallowing, and you just return to it because you need it. Well, that's just like a drunk returning to his own vomit. I will seek it yet again, he says. But in Christ, you don't need any of those things. In Christ, we are promised peace in the midst of all manner of tribulation. There is no evil that has ever happened to any of us, and I know for myself that plenty of evil has happened. Amen. I've caused evil to others. I've been injurious. I've sinned. I've hurt people. But because of Christ, because of the love of God, because of forgiveness, and because of the promise, thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Not a promise to keep soldiers away from your door, but a promise to give you peace in your heart, inside, inner peace, true peace, so that you don't need to go to these other places to get these other things, 
to satisfy uh, the problems that you have. I myself, for years, I've had big problems that I myself caused. <laughs> and then having caused them, uh, but not being able to escape the burden of them in my flesh, I, for periods of time, would feel sorry for myself. I looked for other ways uh, to, to hide from the, from the pain, from the, the not knowing, from the, you know, how could this happen this way? Even though, in this instance, it was something that I caused, I knew exactly how it happened. But everybody, lots of people have things that happen to them that, that weren't caused by, by you or by me. And it's just the same age-old question that's always answered, that's always asked by every skeptic of the Word of God. Well, what about this? Well, God is not righteous because he would not allow suffering in the world. Well, he maybe he allowed suffering in the world and he allowed pain and sin. But in the same chapter in which he allowed sin to enter into the world, he promised to take care of it. And he took care of it uh, in Genesis chapter 3 by shedding blood. And both Advents, the first Advent and the second Advent of Christ, are prophesied in those first three chapters. So, okay, he let some bad things happen, but he took care of it. He made, way, he made a way out of it. He promised you that you're going to end up in a place where you, where, where you will remember those things no more. Where, where, where every, tea, every tear shall be wiped from your eye. But that's not yet. Okay, it's not yet. But what he also promises is that right now today, you can have peace. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, ye shall find rest for your souls in a parallel passage. Come unto me. Come unto me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. See. Forgive the lack of harmony. <laughs> all right. Now, if you got a problem with drinking, then don't drink. Amen? If you're near or know about a guy that's got a problem with drinking, don't drink. And if you're a preacher, then you know what? Or anybody, any Christian, because let's just face it, in this day and age, 9 out of 10 people have a problem with drinking. In Gainesville, in Gainesville where I live, they pull over people, or you get pulled over for speeding or traffic violation. In every instance, they always check. Uh, to see if you've been drinking. Because it's a known fact that 90% of the pop I'm making up the number, a large contingent of the people in Gainesville are known drinkers. So in that instance, uh, as a bishop, as a preacher of the Word of God, the way to walk charitably towards your brother is not to do it. Don't offend him by it. Not only don't offend the guy who's got an issue about it because his grandfather... I uh, was in a car accident, uh, killed by a drunk driver. But you don't put it in your brother's face, who's a stumbling block, who you've led to the Lord, who's a new baby in Christ, who's trying to grow. You have to put others before you, see. And importantly, as an example, um, turn to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. One of the things that we're meant to have as Christian, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 in one hand, Romans 6 in another. One of the things that we're meant to have as Christians, that we do have, whether or not we exercise it, that we're promised, that we're given, because of Christ, is the ability to overcome our own sin and our own problems. Uh, so first, Romans chapter 6. And look in verse uh, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, we just got through the whole chapter 5 talking about grace, grace, grace. God is gracious to us. God has forgiven us. God has justified us. God has uh, delivered us from judgment. Uh, God has made us righteous. And the last verse in the chapter, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And then we have chapter 6, whose message is uh, 
the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, our Lord. Because the question, the question that it asks in verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is the same question asked by all Catholics, all lost people, all everyone who wants to accuse God of unrighteousness and say it just can't be that easy. That's just not right that you can just be forgiven. That God would forgive somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer and give him eternal life in heaven if he believes on Christ. That's just not right. I just don't see how that can, I just can't reconcile that. You can't reconcile it because you think you're better than Jeffrey Dahmer and you're not. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But secondly, that's not the end of the story. He said, be not deceived. God is not mocked, which you think you're mocking him with that argument. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. So don't you worry. Every crooked path shall be made straight. Everything's going to be paid for. Saved or no, you can lose your health. You can lose your job. You can lose your family. You can lose your ability to talk. You can lose your sanity. You can lose your mind. You can suffer. You can be forced to live in pain. Anything that can happen to a lost guy on this earth can happen to you and me here today. But God promises peace in those things. So that's why we that's why you see people rejoicing at, at, at funerals, that their loved one went home to be with the Lord. And yeah, they cry because they miss them. We, 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 we cry because we miss them. Rejoice when they rejoice and weep when they weep. And we long to see them and wish they were still here. But we're supposed to put others' needs before ourselves. And if you're really thinking about them and where they are. The Bible says to depart and to be with Christ is far better. Philippians chapter 2. Far better. Amen. And all those other wounds and all those other sufferings, those are things that God gives us victory over. Uh, Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. And then verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in Romans 6, just to summarize, you have the power in Christ by the Holy Ghost to overcome sin, to not be its servant which you become its servant when you're given to it. Just like you're the servant of wine when you are given over to wine. It controls you. You don't control it. See? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so in Christ, we have the power to not only to overcome sin, but not to be under the power of any of these other things, such as wine. Um... 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and look in verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, which is similar to what he said in um, Romans 14. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. Under the pure, all things are pure. I am convinced, or I am persuaded, that nothing is unclean of itself, he said. And here he says, all things are lawful. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. But I will not be brought under the power of any. So over there in Romans 14, it's not expedient because you stop walking charitably towards your brother and put your own needs ahead of his when you insist on your liberty. But in this case, it's not expedient because you come under its power and are no, no longer your own master. You are the servant of the thing that, you're, that you put yourself under. Uh, in the case, in what we're talking about, uh, alcohol. You become the servant of alcohol, and it has power over you. But that could be anything, whatever you happen to be addicted to. You're addicted to marijuana, then you're under the power of marijuana. Whether or not you're intoxicated, you're under its power. You returned, I will seek it yet again, he said. When shall I awake, I will seek it again. Now fill in the blank of whatever your problem is, and don't say you don't have a problem, because every one of us either have had or still has a problem with something like that. Maybe it's a TV show. 
Maybe it's a movie. Maybe it's a person that you know you shouldn't be around. Maybe it's the bar. Maybe it's a glass of wine. Whatever it is, turn back to 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. Not given to wine. Not given to much wine. Now I hope I I hope that I made it clear, the Bible teaching. Uh, that there are s more than one. There's more than one uh, example in Scripture in the words taught by the Holy Ghost that are examples of uh, appropriate uses for alcohol. Otherwise, we just outlaw grapes. And not have them at all anywhere right and that's what a lot of preachers would have you to do and you know what I'd rather have you do that than be a drunkard but what's worse than the than the entire issue is you are lying about what the Word of God says and that is a crime higher than than any fornication that you can commit that's a sacred trust that you're given by your Father in Heaven uh, to be faithful to the Word of God. Uh, the Bible says in Revelation, these words are true and faithful. But you just held the truth in unrighteousness when you lied about what they said so that you could force the appearance of godliness. Wherein actual, whereas actual godliness is the exercise and practice of the principle, not the hard rule of do this, don't do that. See, turn to Galatians chapter uh, four. Galatians chapter four, and look down in verse uh, six, seven. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then. When ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that, ye have known God, or rather, are known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, wherein ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. You're all hung up on this ceremony and these dates and these rules. Why are you subject to those things? You're supposed to learn the principle of not your own righteousness, but God, trusting in God's righteousness, the righteousness which is of God by faith, uh, which I dare say is absent from most preaching. Turn to Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and look down in verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, example in uh, Romans 14, in or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So all these things, holy days, new moon, Sabbath days, which were practices uh, from Judaism, they are a type of something that's going to be brought back later. And there's a deeper thing involved there that I don't fully know about and I'm not going to get into. But look at verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward. So we're talking about losing your reward in heaven. In a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshy mind, that's people preaching about their experience and dealing with devils when they don't have any idea what they're talking about. Lying. Said, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, that's Christ, from which all the body by joints and bands have nourished and ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Parentheses, touch not, taste not, hail not. Which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and, and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom. See, that's the reason 
why it's so prevalent. That's why you spend more time preaching about the length of a woman's hair. And don't get me wrong. I think a woman should have long hair. Her hair is a crown of glory. And it's a shame for a man of short hair. But, but who doesn't know that? And that's why some of you, you, but some of you preachers, you spend more time talking about the length of a woman's hair than you do the mysteries of the kingdom of God, which it, which it says in the New Testament that you are meant to be a steward of. And most of you don't even know what they are, can't list them, and couldn't describe them if you did list them. See? Which things have indeed a show of wisdom, and the reason why is because you're an imitator, not a follower. You're making a show, because you want to force the appearance of godliness. See? But long hair and long skirts, and, modest, and the appearance of modesty, and modesty is a good thing, but that's, that's, that's not the righteousness that you're supposed to trust in. Let it be the inner adornment of the heart. People should speak, see your meek and quiet spirit, not the show that you put on. See. And so, uh, back in 1 Timothy 3, those are all things that are important to understand in this issue about not drinking wine. And the instruction in 1 Timothy 3 is exactly as it's written, not given to wine. And also explained by the cross-reference later in the chapter for deacons, not given to much wine. And as the scripture teaches us in, uh, in the verses that I showed you, there are circumstances in which you should just not drink wine at all. And that's... Uh, if your brother's going to be offended, if you're going to be a bad example, as long as I have a hard time, that pretty much covers everybody in this country. But it's but the Bible teaches that's not the end of the story. It doesn't exist for itself. It's the operation of the principle of walking charitably towards your brother. See, Love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one toward another. And everything that he instructs us to do is an extension of that first and great of the second commandment, which is like under the first one: uh, love your neighbor as yourself. See, not given to wine. All right, that's enough for tonight. Um, would you close in prayer? Lord, thanks for the word preached. <clears throat> Thank you for the clarity of your word in that. Uh, things don't have to contradict. I think you say, you know, all things are pure. Nothing is impure of itself. Nothing is wicked and evil of itself. Um, things like alcohol uh, have good uses. And, uh, you know, you give it to us for medicine, maybe to use lightly. But thank you for the warning, not just letting us blindly wander into alcohol, not knowing how dangerous it is, how uh, harmful it can be. And I pray that you'll protect us, protect our families from the, the harm of uh, alcoholism and uh, excessive drinking. And I pray that you'll help us not, just like Jeff preached, not to say, you know, the Bible, your words don't say that nobody can ever drink wine, period, ever. Help us not to be like most people who would say that, uh, but rather just accept what you said as, you know, drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thine oft infirmities. And not to be given to wine, not to drink much wine. And um, just help us to be wise and do what's right with it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Any questions? Uh, no, but... <laughs> you can ask me later at home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. if, but if, if, the, if your video covered... Words of that, sure.